Cool. We're on, we're on the air. This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog, as well as on the Laugh Button Podcast Network. Dan Natterman here with Noam Dorman, owner of the world famous Comedy Cellar, Periel Ashenbrand, the show's producer and on air personality as well. Didn't start out that way, but hasn't evolved in that direction. With us, Dean Edwards, stand up comic, actor, singer, writer, musician, first artist. His multiple TV appearances include Saturday Night Live and The Sopranos. And of course, he's a regular, or was until the pandemic, at the world famous comedy <laughs> star. Dean, it's been a while. Good to have you with us. Yeah, and, uh, good to see you, Dan. Your interest is you're a musician and singer, which I didn't know. Um, I used to, I mean, I, most of my friends in college knew me as a rapper before, uh, before they knew me as a comic. Um, when you said that, I was like, oh, wow, someone, someone did some research. <laughs> well, Periel it believes in, 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 uh, detailed introductions. Yeah, yeah. So he dug that up somewhere and I didn't know that. But I know a lot of comedians are musical. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Dave Chappelle, I believe, is a musician. Of course, Craig uh, Robinson's a musician. Yeah, of course, Craig, yeah. Um, numerous other, Kyle Dunnigan does a lot of music and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, good to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, I, man, I too seen, long. I don't too think long. it's been, I don't think I've seen you since before the pandemic. Probably, Maybe I think the last time, the, the last time I, I played the, the cellar in the Village Underground was, was I want to say, March 11th or 12th. 20, 2020 and I, I the only reason I remember is because I had to, I had to cancel that weekend because um, Godfrey and I lost a bunch of gigs in the uh, in the Middle East and so I hit my agents and, and scrambled and said listen man I, I need some dates and I think Marlon Wayans canceled um, in West Palm so I had to fly out the next morning to go do that weekend and then everything shut down um, before I came home. Well, we're going on a, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's almost a year. Yeah, yeah, it's man. been going on, but I've seen some people here and there. Right. You know, over the right. summer, I used to go to the comedy cellar because there was outside seating. So I used to see right. you. I don't think I ever saw you there, but anyway. You know what? I did see you uh, the, the one, one, one of the few nights, I think I went once just to hang out. Um, and I saw you and Val and I think Russ Maneev. And then two more times I uh, I came through the night that I think Louis C.K. and Keith went on, I was on, and um, one other night, the night before, during that week, and then um, I haven't been, been on really since, you know. Um, but I also wanted to add and salute to Noam because you're, you're part of the reason I was prepared. Um, I, I just shot a, actually I have a comedy special premiering on Tuesday on Netflix. Um, Tiffany Haddish presents They Ready season two. Um, we shot and and one of the reasons I was so gun ready was because of getting all the reps. So I, I wanted to thank Noam and SD. I planned on sending y'all a, a message actually to, on uh, Friday saying That's thank terrific. you because the, the multiple stage, stage repetitions um, at least had me prepared so that for the six weeks leading up to um, up to the show, I I had a, a general idea of a good amount of the material I wanted to do, and uh, and that's the seller's a big reason for that. So thank you. That's terrific. Our pleasure. By the way, um, uh, somebody had their TV on or something. I hear a, a, a like a. You know what? My 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 wife has her friends class. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're sharing space. I, I have a wife, too, and I know there's nothing you can do about oh, okay. it. Don't worry. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I mean, you want to have a that's life why, after this podcast, that's, right? That's why I led with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so what else? What else? Did anybody get the vaccine? No, no, we're, no we're young, healthy people, relatively speaking. Yeah. Uh, so we, we don't get vaccinated. If I, if I were to get an offer, like somebody said, listen, I have a friend who can hook you up with the vaccine. Right. Should I take it or not? Of course. Why wouldn't you? Because ostensibly, I, I, I'd be going ahead of someone else who might be told there's no, you know, they're, they're out of this. I, by the way, to, to me, I'm people wondering, I actually don't have that opportunity. But I do know people who have, who have uh, gotten um, hooked up, as it were, 
with the who vaccine. Who jumped the line? Who jumped the line? Yeah, yeah. So and is it um, jumping the line, or is it that you know, like the Titanic, they those first few lifeboats, it was, nobody wanted to get on them. So is it okay? Fine. Right, right. Oh, oh okay. I'm not. I'm not judging it. I'm just, um, you know, based on the conversation we're having, uh, it, it seems like uh, there there's a negative connotation behind someone like like Noam just said that got it and uh, they got hooked up as opposed to you know whatever the the rollout is you know i was watching on the news earlier that one one uh fire chief um is is probably about to do some time because one of his underlings actually he he was stealing only three only three <laughs> three vials of it you know like if you're gonna steal it don't don't get, go to jail for three vials <laughs> go all out there <laughs> So Periel, like Periel is a friend of his friend Satish. Well, Periel, what if Satish told you, you know, don't tell anybody, but I, I can get you a vaccine. Would you take I'd it? There to, I'd be there tomorrow. Well, if I, I get thought the, that get that... in the fucking car right now. Are you kidding? First of all, the entire hypocrite. system in this country works like that. So let's not mm. pretend that having privilege or money or something doesn't afford you better mm. medical care in every mm. single situation. So what's your point here? Is that like, why is this different than anything else? Like if you had cancer, God forbid, and you knew a doctor at Sloan Kettering who said, oh yeah, I could get you a spot, even though there's a three month wait period, would you not go to Sloan Kettering because you were taking somebody else's spot? Uh, I don't know what I would do. I that. know. I guess, I guess I probably, I, won't, I guess faced with life and death, I probably would take the spot and, and maybe not be terribly proud of myself but we're not talking about that we're talking about taking a vaccine that's i mean you, you just have to wait a wait a little bit longer that's they're all, all no they're also throwing out vaccines you know when i took my parents to get vaccinated in queens Ariel, uh, me think you doth protest a little harshly here like are, are you is there something <laughs> you want to tell us about your access to the vaccine no, I'm fessing up. I would get, I would, if I had a chance to get it, I would get it and not feel the slightest bit guilty about it. Cause I don't <laughs> think I'm taking it from somebody else. I if I, I had the chance to get it last week when my parents got it and I, I'm not saying I did, but if I had the chance, maybe I did. <laughs> it's all, <laughs> look, if you're not taking it from people, I, if you're not taking it, the issue is, is, are you taking it from people? And I don't think you are. I, I, don't I, was think you are. I was told that if you go to a pharmacy in New York, that some pharmacies that are offering it, I don't know if this is true, but if, if there's nobody showed up that day to get vaccinated, they'll give it to you. They'll, no matter they're, whether they're you're young or old. Vaccines. That's what they well, told, they vaccinate. My dad's almost 80 and he, my mom was supposed to get it on a Saturday and my dad had an appointment on Monday and they let my dad get it the same day as my mom because it was towards the end of the day and they mm. said if we you know we, we'll we throw them out and then they asked me do you want one too honey no. there we go no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so no no i mean your question is i mean it's a hypothetical i don't know if it has much real world application because i don't think that's happening i think that people that are getting vaccinated are, that are younger are getting vaccinated because otherwise they would have thrown out the vaccine. No, no, no. People are getting hooked up. Of course, I mean, that's the way the world yeah. works. Because of it. Actually, Donald right. Trump said something like that one time. He said, unfortunately, you know, that's the way the world works. And he got a lot of flack from it. But uh, mm. it's the case, you know, I just, I might not, I, I, I would not feel that comfortable about doing that, given the fact that I'm okay. And that right. uh, if I had access to a vaccine, I, I might, try to give it to like, you know, Steve, Steve Fabricant's dad, who's in Florida, who's having trouble getting one or something. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. If I would. It's not that simple. You can't transfer a vaccine available in New York to Steve right. Fabricant's father, who's in Florida. Yeah. So if there's a vaccine and they're going to throw it away, you would take it. You know, you know, what's interesting to me is that I don't vote. And Periel says to me, how can you not vote? And I'm like, well, my vote doesn't matter. I'm in New York. Well, she goes, if everybody thought that way, could you imagine what would happen? <laughs> and I, now, I'm like, yeah, but nobody, everybody does it that way. Now you're like, I grabbed that vaccine in a heartbeat. That's the way it won't work, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, an idiot? <laughs> what a hypocrite. <laughs> I just think that it's insane to draw the line at the COVID vaccine 
where like most things that were afforded were afforded because of luck or privilege or some combination of both of those things. So why is the COVID mm -hmm. vaccine any different? I, I think what you're I think what you're saying is actually um, absolutely asinine. But I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not sure I understood it. I think what you're saying is that because the world is so unfair, we should no longer worry about doing things that are unfair. I think I think that's what I heard you say. Anarchy, <laughs> chaos. That's no, of not course. What I'm the... saying. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, I'm go ahead. I'm saying <laughs> that if you have money and privilege, you were able to order food online during the pandemic and not have to go to a grocery store, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think anybody can. I think anybody who can buy food can order it online. But go ahead. False. There were people who were in the stores doing the shopping for people who like me and you. Okay. Okay. I make sure there's some people who, who don't oh, have. To okay. Them, but, so but, now my point is a little bit more well taken. I don't. No, see I have, still have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Does anybody, Dan? You want to? You want to jump in, Dean? I got well, nothing. She's saying she doesn't feel <laughs> guilty about being privileged, but we're talking about a, a, an, an issue of where if if you if you, by not taking the vaccine, somebody else would get it, versus it would get thrown away. I didn't yeah, say that, I don't feel guilty. That, 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 that's the that's the uh, the question. No, and before Satish gets here, we get deep into COVID. I would like to uh, at least take advantage of our one uh, of our one-on-one -on -one time with Dean to find out a little bit of how he's been occupying himself. Uh, during these pandemic months, oh, bro, I'm man. Listen, I'm I'm my family's sick of me, and I'm sick of them. Nah, um, <laughs> it's it's been a challenge because we we you know fortunately we have we have a house, but it's a New York City house, so this is not like I'm in the West Wing and my family's in the West Wing. I I pretty much was relegated to my bedroom because. Um, the eldest started, graduated and started college during this and college is in her bedroom and my youngest is still in high school from her bedroom or the dining room. My wife is a professor, so I'm actually in her classroom, uh, what's normally her classroom. And I was just in the, uh, in, in the bedroom of the basement. And uh, the beauty of at least when we had decent weather, I would go and sit out in the backyard and, uh, and hang out there, but it's, you know, it's in the thirties. And <laughs> so- The weather uh, makes all the difference, you know, when you can yeah, go outside, does, really hang does. out in the park, uh, you know. Yeah, go take a walk, just walk around the block, just just to, just to not have cabin fever, um, you know, win and succumb to just being stuck in the house. But I think, I mean, when, when Tiffany called me in August, from, from August, even re really through, through um, right now i've been occupied with with focusing on making sure i was i was funny enough that people wouldn't turn past me on netflix and, and promoting it and and it's giving me something to do you know it's a special called your netflix special is it's it's tiffany Haddish presents they ready season two and um it's it's myself godfrey tony woods aaron jackson Barbara Carlisle and uh, and Kim Clark out of LA, and so six of us we, we each um, got a, I think the specials um probably average about twenty some odd minutes, um, and uh, for me it was also dope because I I actually at the end of uh at the end of twenty nineteen I actually recorded myself saying I'm shooting a special in twenty twenty for Netflix, and I actually uh, when I showed. Tiffany and, and Paige Hurwitz from uh, from Wanda Sykes' company uh, pushed it, but they were all blown away. They were like, you manifested. I was like, hey, I just, you know, I believe it in uh, speaking things into existence. I'm real big on energy. And so uh, so now I'm more so, okay, now I'm speaking a full hour into existence and, and <laughs> you know, millions of dollars and so forth. That's, that's, a, that's a great lineup, by the way. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I and I, I honestly, I think the reason they uh, obviously she, she chose people because we each um, somehow touched her, affected her on her on her, um, you know, journey in in this entertainment business, and she she spoke to each of us about that. Um, but I think she also was wise in saying, you know, I know Dean has a, a strong 
20, 30 minutes ready. I know Godfrey has a strong, strong set already intact, Tony Woods and so forth. Um, so that even though we only had, you know, a month and a half or so to prepare and getting stage time was going to be scarce, you know, we, we, all, we all knew that, that we'd come in ready. Where'd you film it? Were you able to get a live audience? Or? Yeah, yeah, we actually shot it out um, out at Long Beach Terrace Theater, man, where Richard Pryor shot uh, his first concert, live in concert. Wow. Um, we shot at this. We shot at the same the same theater. They um they we we all had to um, go through the necessary um, COVID precautions as far as getting multiple tests. They tested the audience. The audience was masked. They shot it. We actually shot in front of the theater. We shot some things interior as far as like a round table discussion, but the actual stage, they built a stage in front of the theater so that we were at least outdoors. But when you watch it, you can't tell. You, you, you can hardly tell that it's outdoors unless there's one shot where you can see a tree in the distant, uh, distant background. But aside from that, I, when I watched it, I was amazed at, at how impressive they they were with the uh, production value and making it look like we were indoors. Erin Jackson, terrific, by the way. She she oh, not, yeah. she's not that well known, but she's really yeah. good. Yeah, Erin Erin is uh and and it's funny because Erin, she you know we were talking leading up to it and and you know she's such a she's such a comedian's comedian um, where she she likes to work out you know, five, six times a night just to get the right verbiage and to economize her, her language. And, you know, going into, because um, we take two nights, we shot on a Friday and a Saturday. And on Friday night, um, before the show, she was like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I just, I, I, I you could see she, she was, she was a bundle of nerves in a good way because she just wanted to make sure um, her set was concise and ready because, Normally, when you shoot something, you want to go and work out in the city that you're you're playing and, and prep, you know, and just get a feel for the audience. And we really didn't have that opportunity. But after Friday night show, I think everyone was was ready and said, OK, Saturday, because because I mean, helicopters, Godfrey had two helicopters go by <laughs> while he was while he was performing on Friday night. And I had a. Uh, Adam, two motorcycles um, drown out punchlines, so you had to say, you know what, I want to stop on and do that again. That's the beauty of TV. That's so great. No, by the way, we ask you this every week, but there, is there any further information uh, regarding the reopening of the Comedy Cellar? Just a, an update. I know we go through this all the time, but... Uh... <laughs> there's, there's no update, and, I, and I'm... Um... I mean, I don't even know. Like, I'm, I, I'm having trouble remembering I had a comedy song. Like, it's been so long. It's so <laughs> weird. Uh, you know, I, I said this a long time ago, but now I, I can really say it. I can totally see how, um, for whatever reason, if you get used to not working, mm. for whatever reason, either, either it's be, either because you have a tremendous amount of money or because you're on government assistance or, or whatever it is, it really does, it is bad for your soul. It, it is. You get used to it and it, and I can see how it will be hard to put my pants on in the morning and start going to work every day again. You know, I, I can see that. I, and, um, you know, it, it, it worries me. Like people have to get back to work. It's not gonna be that easy. No, do you do you look at it as sort of like uh, I mean this is this is obviously exaggerating, but do you look at it as almost like a slow drawn out death, <laughs> not not happen? And by that I I guess I say that because I remember uh, my dad passed in two thousand seven, and he retired in two thousand six, and I I honestly I don't I don't believe in retirement because I think having a daily purpose, having a something to do every day gives you drive and purpose and keeps you uh you know excited about life and and i remember the um maybe a month or two, a few months before he passed my mother actually saying dean dino daddy looks old and he did he because he wasn't getting up and, and going every day and so i i i, I agree with what Noam is saying that you know pe when you get used to not doing anything it's a. It's easy to 
succumb to you know whatever demons you have in your life whether it's drugs or, or or liquor or what have you whatever vices you have but when you have purpose even if you're 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 on drugs and you, you have to go to a job yeah you're a functioning uh you know drug head or or uh alcoholic but you have a function if you're just sitting at home you're just wallowing in it you just and you just have more access to the poison so yeah so it's, it's a bad time yeah. <laughs> uh welcome satish let me give him a formal you know you know periel is a stickler for intros <laughs> but i want to ask him the first question go ahead into the uh, satish palai palai good to see you guys hey, what's up? i'm sorry satish. we've had you before Do dr satish, dr. satish, satish palai. Palai, senior investigator in viral pathogenesis at the Palant Research Institute and a professor of lab medicine at U University of California, San Francisco. Until COVID, he was basically working on a cure for AIDS and pivoted once COVID. And, and a musician, and a fine musician. Oh, is he a musician? Yeah, yeah, yeah musician? His, his, his music's on YouTube. Um, That's right. Satish, I have a question for you. Yeah. If I have a friend who can hook me up with a vaccine, you know, like after hours at the pharmacy or something, you know, should yeah. I take it? Absolutely, you should. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you, guys thinking, uh, were you okay. guys thinking the opposite? No, no one basically told me that I was totally amoral but when I was like... <laughs> no, no, it, no, he was saying you're amoral. Let me, let, me, wait, wait, let, me, let, me, let me clarify something. Okay, so there are cases where um, there's like a dose uh, sitting someplace that's going to wind up in a, a trash bin if it's not given to someone. I don't think you should cut in line and... Um, you know, take a vaccine away from somebody who desperately needs it. But there are definitely cases, you know, there's suboptimal allocation of these resources, right? And there are definitely cases where doses are going to be, uh, they're going to wind up in a wastebasket. And, in, and mm. in that case, you should definitely take one. I don't think you should jump in and take one if somebody else is going to get deprived. I, was, I wasn't talking about one that uh, fell off the truck, as they say in the Sopranos. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm talking about cutting the line because no. I have, because I have access. It's not cutting the line though. If somebody offers you a vaccine, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It's not supposed to. It's my, it's my, it's my hypothetical, my rules, okay? It's not happening. my hypothetical that someone who works in a pharmacy who's not supposed to do so calls me up and says, listen, come in, come in, the, come in the parking lot. I'll hook you up. One, two, three. Is, is that happening, Satish? Are people cutting the line? Or are people just doses that would have otherwise been thrown away going to people that are not in risk groups? I've heard of the latter happening. In terms of people cutting the line, I think it's, I haven't heard any definite stories about that, about people actually cutting the line. It's just kind of the standard story where we have some pretty serious health disparities in this country. And so the, the have nots are, uh, as usual, getting more screwed than the, uh, the haves. Um, right. and so we're seeing the that's things. what I was saying. Right? That's how, how are the have nots getting screwed? Tell, that's important. Tell us about that. It's the same thing where you know, they're deprioritized de one way or another, or they're just not uh, that many uh, centers where they're actually um, giving out the vaccines in resource limited settings or um it's exactly like everything else with health disparities and medical so, care i'm actually i'm quite curious about that so for instance i know two people who took the vaccine mm -hmm. um who were over 65 who just got an appointment you know through regular channels um and went and got the vaccine neither of which um benefited from their bank accounts in any way. I mean, one of them ha didn't have much money and one of them has more money, but n neither of those facts came to play. H how is it that someone who is a have not, as you put it, wouldn't be able to do exactly like the people that I know who did it? So I'm not saying that there's like a, like a direct, you know, uh, survey of people's you know, bank accounts. So, you know, there's some formula about what your uh, material wealth is and whether or not you can get the vaccine. It's even something as simple as just like the number of centers that are distributing vaccines, you know, with respect to other demographic variables and everything else. You know, it's something that, that wouldn't that would probably wouldn't be in Manhattan so much or New York City, but you mean like, like somewhere in the middle of the country somewhere? Or... Yeah, I, I think I think that's an issue, um, and I think in general, and, and and hopefully this will be rectified because you know now I think we have some people running the show that are um, legitimately engaged in, in making this all happen better. But the, um, I mean, just the rollout of the vaccines has been 
far from optimal and it's just going way, way, way more slowly. Well, than it. Actually, there is an irony to what you're saying. You've probably seen this because the states that have been doing best per capita have been small, poor states, many of them. Mm -hmm. West, West Virginia, the Dakotas. I don't know if the Dakotas are poor or not, but they're but definitely, uh, you know, that the, 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 I mean, it, it's in California where, I mean, yes, you have people in the federal government now who maybe are better motivated, but California really shouldn't need President Biden to get their shit together, right? I mean, California is, is, is a huge country all on its own, uh, and they and they they're just going to they're just running a shit show there. So let me tell you, when you say they shouldn't need that, that's not the way I actually think about it. I think the the only way that we're going to have an effective response against this pandemic is to have a coordinated federal response. I don't think it should be the kind of thing where you know every county or every state sort of fends for themselves and has their own public well, health. What can, what, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm saying what can the federal government do for Gavin Newsom? Is that his name? That he can't that he's constrained from doing from himself. He can't marshal California resources and California clinics to be like in New York, in New York, for instance, they weren't open 24 mm seven. -hmm. What does that have to do with Trump or Biden? Like that's the, that's our governor open the fucking thing 24 seven. Right. The one thing is, even though California is, uh, you know, has got resources, uh, the federal government has a lot more resources that they could mobilize to do this. And the other thing is, just Satish, Satish. look, yeah, look yeah. me in the eye and tell me, you think that the reason California is, screwing up this vaccine rollout has anything to do with a lack of resources no i don't think it's because we're a, a poor state no i don't i don't think i don't think that's why i think there's there's multiple problems but really what i think management it, it but it ha that we need to have a centralized unified strategy in the way we do this for this to work correctly that's what i think maybe I, i'm, I'm well, not against the central i'm a I'm not against the centralized. No, but. let me give you a very simple reason why we can't have like a state by state solution. One, one very, very simple reason is that um, we don't live in some sort of magical fragmented habitat where what happens in California stays in California or, you know, what happens in Idaho stays there, right? We have uh, people going back and forth. So, you know, we exist in, in a soup. Um, and so even if we have really effective management in one location, you know, all we need is one week of Lincoln defense to, to compromise the whole. No, no, I don't, I don't, don't misconstrue me. I, 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 of course, we're all connected. I'm, I'm just, uh, based, based on life, life, life experience, I don't see any reason whatsoever that something would be better managed for th by one central thing for 300 million people than, for instance, Mayor Bloomberg would be able to manage New York City's vaccine rollout. I think that it's a, it is a kind of an act of faith and a myth to think that the people in Washington are better at running things. I do agree with you that if there's a shortage of money, if there's mm -hmm. a shortage of money and resources, yes, if, if a, you know, then Washington should make sure that nobody is, is foregoing things because they don't have the money. Poor states, Mississippi, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Money Washington can provide. But logistics and, and management skills... Mm -hmm. These are almost lie. impossible from from thousands of miles away. You need to be close to it, and Washington has no advantage. And and if you just look at things which Washington does manage, like the post office, or I mean, any number of things, there's oh, no, no indication that they they know how to do it. Or 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 the VA. Let's talk about something you know about the sure. VA hospitals. I do know. About you want to tell me that that's that's evidence of Washington handling things better from a central resource? They've been trying to fix these VA hospitals my entire adult life and there's, and there's still outrages. What, what, I mean, if they could do that right, then I'd say, well, yeah, maybe they should be able to roll out a vaccine for 300 million people better than a local government. They can't even run a small VA hospital system. They're terrible. I mean, just to extend that, like what would be the, like for instance, having the military, like having an armed forces that represents the entire nation that's coordinated at the federal level. Like, I'm not sure the military is so good, but you know, only, we can only have one military. I, I'm, I mean, we hear, we hear stories and have heard stories of ridiculousness of the military, right? But yeah, okay. military is also, you go into training. I mean, I, I don't think you could compare the military, which has years and years of institutional experience and unlimited resources to a uh, seat of the pants pop-up.
a coming into office that has changed that has changed the uh, the game at all, if if anything. So in, well, we in, haven't heard tweets every day. <laughs> which, which, ain't, which, is, which, which isn't nothing, to be honest. And, and the other thing, um, which I'm sure you guys have, have heard repeatedly, is just the fact that the people who are actually scientists and doctors that are running the public health effort are actually free to speak their minds. And it seems like, you know, it's early days, but it seems like Biden and the other people who are in control now are willing to listen to people who are scientists and doctors, you know, rather than the pillow guy. Um, <laughs> that's really important we it's probably going to take you know a month or two before we see a, a, an impact on the pandemic and how it's managed you know i don't think this stuff happens overnight but i'm, I'm really optimistic based on what i've seen so far that we're going to see improvements on the ground and like to give you one idea you know kind of speaking from what my background is like um you know in terms of how the vaccines are rolled out that's kind of one component of a multi-component strategy right you need in addition to vaccination you need testing and you need molecular surveillance, right? So I'm sure you guys have seen all these news stories about the different genetic variants of SARS and two that are popping up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really for the vaccines to work, you need, it's like all hands on deck. You need to have a really, really strong mandated public health intervention. So everybody's wearing masks and everything else to limit spread outside of the vaccines. You need to have really good testing, contact tracing if we can actually have it. Um, and then also, you know, molecular surveillance so we can, look to see when there are new emerging strains of the virus and, and we need to understand whether they compromise the vaccine or not. It's so it's, again, it's like there are many, many facets to this. And I, I think it'd be very difficult to just have it be a Wild West situation where every region is managing this uh, you know, according to their own guidelines and principles. I, I think that's dangerous. So well, Tish, I'm, I'm oh go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, you go. Go ahead, Dean. No, I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on on specifically African Americans, but you know, people of color and their paranoia towards taking the vaccine. Yeah. And can you speak on that and and how uh, I'm happy you narrowed down the question because I thought he was just gonna have a free what do you think of African Americans question. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, <you're great. laughs> like what do you think of me? <laughs> No, I mean, I think that there's a um, there's a real historical precedent there associated right. with paranoia. So it's fully justified and understandable. Um, and I think um, basically it is the job of the scientific establishment to convey information as fluidly and openly as possible to people of color to make them understand why it is worthwhile for them, mm -hmm. um, why it makes sense. And actually, there was a very cool, um, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci. Um, what was the name of the woman? But there was a um, very famous African American activist in D.C. who actually set up like this Zoom forum with with Dr. Fauci about this exact issue. Oh, really? You know what? I'll I'll send you guys the the link to the recording of this conversation. Oh, I'd like to check that it's out. Really, yeah. really, it's the whole conversation was geared around this one question and and what really needs to be done here. Right. You know what? I just I, so Dean, wait, can I can I say, Dean? I actually have a much harsher opinion than Satish does. I, mm -hmm. And I think that um, I mean, Satish's answer is the, is the, is the common uh, decent person's right. answer, which is that, well, they have a, you know, they have a justification, blah, blah, blah. I would say, no, I, I would say to, and I thought about this, like, what would you say to a loved one? If I was a loved one, if he has a black African-American, if it's my African-American wife, I'd say, honey, I'd say, honey, don't be ridiculous. Tuskegee mm -hmm. was, a hundred years ago, and mm. it was a uh, you know people were sick and they and they re and they let them stay sick. There's mm. no reason that you should take something that happened a hundred years ago and transpose it onto a vaccine which is being distributed to everybody, white, black, all young. That's just pure paranoia, and no. I don't want I don't even want to give you an inch on that, honey, because it's dangerous. <laughs> yes, yes. I, because I'm Jewish, I can bring back all sorts of things that have happened in history to right. try to create a scenario as to why I shouldn't trust. Some, and people look at me, what's the matter? Are you, are you serious right now? Like they would look at me like, you're nuts. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm not taking away the outrage of what happened in history, but right. there is no connection, no connection other than some sort of emotional one, which doesn't stand up to reason between the atrocities of the past, and atrocity is the word for it, and some mm -hmm. rational fear today. And I think by telling people, I understand, yeah, it's reasonable. We're actually 
we're gonna we're 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 keeping that as a permanent kind of thing that people believe because we keep telling them, yeah, yeah, you sh you should be on the lookout for the government to try to injure. And this is why uh, not so long ago when uh, Farrakhan and those guys they were saying, well, AIDS was introduced into the ghetto by Jewish doctors. This was a very difficult conspiracy theory to rebut because they build on these things. And I think that no, it's it's not it's not reasonable. You, I mean, unless you can come with some scenario, it's like a, it's like the election, it's like the election uh, being uh, fixed. It's like, no, you have to have some facts. I'm not going to say to some crazy person, well, you're right, they did do it when Kennedy was running, so it is reasonable for you to think the election was fixed, and I don't want to insult you by telling you you're being ridiculous. No, 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 no. The election was not fixed. You have no evidence, and just because this happened in the past does not mean you're you're on that. so that's my harsh answer but I, that comes from my heart because i care in a certain way not not because i'm trying to be dismissive of people but. no and i i didn't i didn't take it as dismissive but the the retort that i would say is yeah we shouldn't we shouldn't be paranoid but you know in in a quote unquote post racial obama administration there there was a good amount of the population that didn't believe George Floyd could happen, you know, and, and all of the outrage that occurred last year with, with um, you know, police leaning on someone's neck for nearly nine minutes. I, that, I'm, I'm not saying that, that the paranoia is, is uh, justified and some of what Noam said is true, uh, but I'm not going to discount that people have a reason to be paranoid because the system has, has failed and continues to fail them, you know, fail people specifically like myself. Um, hey, Dean, but Dean, this is the thing, I, leaving George Floyd out of it, I, I, someday when, 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 when the world turns again, I'd like mm -hmm. to sit down with you and, and, and play that, you know, go into that in more detail. I don't want to do mm -hmm. it here because it's such a tricky subject to talk about. Right, right, right. To, but I would say that, Yes, my point is this, everything, taking everything you say is true. I, I fear that the end result of that kind of talk is that mm -hmm. it will increase the number of black Americans who don't take the vaccine because they're suspicious of it. And that's, and what I'm trying to do is say, just like from a psychological point of view, what, what, what should the message be if you want to make sure that the maximum number of black people take it with confidence and save their lives? And I mm -hmm. think that the more you say the kind of thing that you're saying, well, who would have thought before George Floyd, blah, 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 I got to have So maybe you should really think about this. Maybe, I think that in the end is going to lead to exactly the opposite result that I think which we all want, which is we want everybody to take the vaccine. We want black people to save their lives and the lives of their loved ones. And I think there is something healthy about saying to somebody, no, stop the crazy talk and take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. well, and, you know, especially within, especially, now, I can't say it, but especially within the community, I'm saying it would be very, very helpful to, to hear that message, I think. But no, you did bring up you did bring up psychological yeah. reactions, which I don't think. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, really. You know, I don't think that can be discounted. I think the re doctor, I think doctor patient relationships are of a special kind. And there is there's an intimacy there. And it's fraught with them. Am I right, Dr. Uh, uh, Palai? So I don't see patients, right? Because I'm just a nerd doctor. I'm, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, <laughs> I don't do that. My, my wife does that, not me. But I, but you know what I'm saying. The, the, the do. doctor patient, it's fraught with, with all sorts of, I mean, this guy is touching your naked body. He's, you know, <laughs> he's, um, we go to, we go to a different doctor, I think. But, yeah. <laughs> he might be touching your naked body. I mean, you know, I had a skin check recently for, for, um, you know, just dermatol. I mean, you know, it's it's sort of an intimate thing, and and there's a lot of, um, you know, and that's not to mention the finger in the ass. <laughs> you, you know, and 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 by the way, I assume, I think there have been studies that people feel better with doctors, like women with women doctors, black people with black doctors. Yes. You know, yep. it, I don't think it's to be discounted that that the the the, the uneasiness that one might feel with a doctor. Uh, just in general. Yeah, I also think that like if 
somebody skeptical about something, uh, the yeah, thing to do is not to yeah, say yeah, you're yeah, being yeah. crazy. Yes. The thing to do <laughs> is actually like talk to them and explain to them and listen to them. Like when your when your wife is well, look, no, in Tom's dog, defense, he I, believes he that they're being crazy, and he has a right to express that belief. No, I, 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 I mean. Crazy is a flippant word. I don't know if I would actually use that to a lot, but I'm saying that uh, I think that the process of dishonestly manipulating somebody and, and giving credence to something that you actually don't believe yourself, like that, like when the truth is that when you say, "Well, I understand, I understand why you feel that way," they're like, "No, I don't really understand why you feel that." I think it's irrational what you're feeling and. Like I said, we don't, we don't, we don't take that tack when people really believe that Trump lost, won the election. We say, no, 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 that's not the way it works. You have to have evidence, and if you don't have the, if you don't have evidence, then you're really making a mistake here. And this is dangerous. And I'm flipping to the vaccine. And by the way, this is dangerous because you can die without this vaccine. So stop with all this fear. It makes no sense. It, it is. A hundred years ago, it, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, maybe there's more recent examples, but Tuskegee was almost a hundred years ago. This is not a relevant historical example, unless you want, I mean, you could think of all sorts of things that happened a hundred years ago that you want to bring them to bear on today. This is another planet from today. And like I said, and again, this is a vaccine which is being distributed to everybody. It is not a secret program to keep information from sick black people that they that they have syphilis. I mean, it's just so, it's nuts to me. But the Tuskegee thing, I mean, that's an extreme event and that's, you know, that's one isolated scenario. But and it's a national shame. I hope nobody gets me wrong. It's, it's a, it is. Of course it is, but the, um, I would say there's been a continuum of not just incidents, but just kind of day-to-day -day perceptions of people involved in public health not always acting on uh, in, in people's best interests or tell us, not tell us. the same Give level of treatment or the same kinds of treatment as other races or ethnic groups. I think that's there's like a general feeling of imbalance. It's not just about these severe examples. I will, I will just say that I will not go to a non-Jewish uh, therapist. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want, because I don't want him sitting there thinking this is one crazy neurotic Jew. You know. So. I hope I didn't. Say, I started by saying it was harsh. I just feel that we we are. We, I don't. We, think we should start from the end first. Oh, that way. We, we, if if we just that's this would make me happy. We should start from the notion that okay, what should the response be to maximize? Yeah. People who might be suspicious. To take it, and I worry that by 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 giving in to the idea, well, you know, this is totally could happen, but in this case, I don't think it is happening. Kind of what it sounds like. Yeah, you're totally reasonable. I mean, you're right. We should be suspicious of the government trying to kill us with a vaccine. So let's look into the reason we don't. I think as soon as you as soon as you seed that ground, some people are gonna like, I, I'm out. I, I'm not taking these chances. I think so that's really, the way I see this. It's crazy. I yeah. I really think it boils down to this, and, and this this goes beyond you know just African Americans and their uh, you know, potential paranoia with the vaccine. In general, I just think scientists and clinicians, there just needs to be a steady stream of information to the public about how these things work. You know what things are not perfect, what things are working really great, what things we still have no friggin' clue about because there are plenty of things that we don't. I think all that information needs to be conveyed regularly and clearly, and I think that's the problem we have in general, even outside of this pandemic. That. Uh, let, there's yeah. not enough let me give you let me give you a hypothetical by, by the way oh, wait, Dan, was oh, it, oh, no i'm making your point admirably no, let me just say my, my one thing and then we'll go on imagine barack obama okay. who was uh probably extremely extremely trusted by um a lot of the country and, and most black people right and he gets on front of the tv and says, what do you think about this vaccine and barack obama said listen don't be crazy i want to tell everybody in in my community take that vaccine, don't give it a second thought. Mm -hmm. Past, we all know the past, that has nothing to do, it has zero to do with today, take that vaccine. I would stand up and cheer for him. I, I think that would be the best thing he could say. And, and for somebody like Barack Obama to say such a thing would be tremendously healthy and, 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 and healing, I, I mean, positive for the country. It needs to be said, and it can only be said by somebody like Barack Obama who has that trust, you know? So mm -hmm. that's that's really what I'm saying. Okay, next thing, Dan, go ahead. I just wanted to, my I just wanted to clarify my point, which was not not contradicting Noam's point, was tangential to Noam's point, yeah. 
about trust between a doctor and a patient and race. And uh, here's a study. Uh, patients more satisfied with care from doctors of same race. When patients have a choice, they are likely to choose a doctor of the same race or ethnic background. This is from uh, BMJ, whatever that is. British um, Medical Journal. Okay, the British Medical Journal. I think that because the relationship between the doctor and the patient is a particularly unique one, um, I, I, I guess the solution would be to have more diversity in medicine. I think this is, a, this is an area where diversity would be uh, helpful. Uh, and and um, I agree with that. So. I don't think a hundred years is that long ago. Yeah. I mean, the Holocaust was like a hundred years ago. Like you can't Not even. You can't just dismiss something because you think it's not relevant. I think Noam's point was is that he doesn't. You see, I mean, you're making my point for me, Periel, by the way, but go ahead. That, that Noam, <laughs> if you were to go to Germany, wouldn't be in fear that he would get rounded up. Although I, I would I say. I don't know about that. Oh my God. A hundred years ago is quite a long time ago. Um, you're talking about the days before television. Uh, I mean, like, you, do, you, do you understand? You know, my, <laughs> they still had horses and buggies in the streets. They knew nothing about, I think this is pre-antibiotics. This is pre-transparency uh, uh, of anything. This is when um, black people, uh, many, many black people walking around um, had been slaves as children, right? Am I, I'm not, I'm not getting there really. Yeah, they're talking about, or they'd be old people by then, but the, the generation of slaves was, was not even gone. Um, I don't see how you can compare that to 2020 America. I, that's just- I think that if you have a group, large group of people that are collectively saying the same thing, it's important to not just dismiss it. That doesn't mean Okay, okay. But, okay, but you are really making my point for me because my point, my, my point is, and this is really what I've been Is there anything to, you can have back me up here? No. no I'm me, just like out here by my, myself. My point is that we, 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 we are just, it's, by the way, I think it's 90 years ago, Tuskegee. We're just too- Now um, you're making my point. No, we're just too uh, ready to concede that these things are are reasonable, I, and and here are somebody like you, and then this, this is nice in a way because it's not emotional. You're not black, and you know there's nothing like I can't insult you about it. I'm telling you, Periel, you just can't think that something that happened 90 years ago is happening today. Because I mean that's just crazy. Here's here's my point on this. Now, you know, again, none of, none of this none of this is happening in a vacuum, right? And so let me ask you this: What do you think about the the justice system in this country? Do you believe that there are biases, or do you think that they're overblown and they're BS. Like, do you think that people of different get, of colors get treated differently in this country? Yeah, no, I, I think there are some biases and some of it is overblown, but you don't have to go back a hundred years for a single example of the justice system to, to, right. to make that case. You can go back, you can, you can go just to a stop and frisk in New York City and make these cases, you know, what I'm saying, yeah, I'm not. But I don't think people can necessarily, uh, can, can necessarily draw like a, a perfect line in the sand between like public health and, and the justice system. They're, they're part of like a larger equation, I think. I, I don't think that they're discrete and completely separated entities. What, what do other people think? Well, I think what you're saying- I agree. I, I agree with Noam that I don't think it's, it's rational. I agree with Satish that I understand why people think it. I understand the psychology. Mm -hmm. um, you had a tremendous number of people believing that AIDS was was injected into. into oh yeah. Bacteria. This was. Um, was that this not was, true? This is this is this is much more harmful that, than the suspicion. Does that that uh, ready to keep an open mind to outrageous conspiracies does much more harm than this than the suspicion and the open mindedness protects against, in my opinion. Much much more harm. People should not think that doctors inv invented AIDS to kill black people. And that, and that should not be aired as a reasonable opinion out there until such time as there's some evidence of it, you know, but it's just, and we, and we are, we are, we're solicitous of these crazy ideas. And I think that we shouldn't be uh, on the left and the right. I mean, we, we're right now, we're witnessing a time when people are very solicitous of outrageous things on the right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should be solicitous of, um, Anyway, I think, like I said, Anything. I think, Noam, you've, you've made your point quite admirably. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, um... Ad nauseum, as if usual. I ask a super 
super quick question because yeah. Satish joined us, I think like one of the first, if not the first episode that we ever did on Zoom. And oh, okay. it was right, one of our best episodes. Right <laughs> when the pandemic hit and I was like, oh my God, we have to get Satish on here. And now you just got your second vaccine, right? Yep, I did. I just got it two days ago and I uh, pretty much felt like dog crap yesterday, but now I'm feeling fine again, which is good. But uh, for 24 hours, I was definitely uh, not feeling so great. Which one? Fi which, which, which? I got the, I got the Moderna. Um, so it's interesting. My wife actually got the Pfizer and I got the Moderna. So we're sort of like a, a little uh, comparative incubator in here. Yep. What's did, she feel, did she feel after she took her second one, how did she feel? She, she felt uh, really bad. She felt even worse than me, actually. I think she spiked uh, an actual fever of like 101 degrees or something. I don't think I registered a legitimate temperature. I felt like I had a fever and had some chills and stuff, but I didn't have, I didn't actually have a registrable temperature. But, um, but the weird thing is like, uh, uh, I actually love the fact that we had these symptoms because in my head I'm picturing, uh, you know, little so soldiers in my immune system kind of going haywire. And um, to me, I would have almost been disappointed if I didn't have any reaction because I'd, I'd sort of scratch my head and wonder if I wasn't really mounting a, an aggressive immune response. So what does it mean now? Like, I heard somebody say that every person who gets vaccinated is at like all of us getting one step closer to some sort of normal life. Like, are we all going to get vaccinated soon? Like, are we going to be safe? I've heard of people getting the vaccine and then getting COVID. Like, how long are you, does it take for it to kick in? I mean, can you impart some wisdom? You actually know somebody who got the vaccine and, and got COVID? I think, did, Noam, didn't you tell me about somebody who got it and no? You told Some, me. I, I, don't know, I don't know of any cases like that, but you know, um, there's a lot of moving parts here. So um, in terms of, I mean, I think where we're going is everybody gets vaccinated and you know, even that's gonna be a problem in terms of vaccine uptake in this country. But for the vaccine to really work, we need to get the majority of people vaccinated. Um, and the other thing that I can't stress enough is that everybody needs to kick it up a notch in terms of masking and all of the other public uh, health protections. And, and, and here's why, right? The, um, what we're noticing now is, you know, there are new genetic variants of the virus that are popping up, right? And this is not, it's not a shocker. Like our, this is how RNA viruses behave. You know, we expect them to mutate over time. And, and it, it was in inevitable that there would be new versions of the virus that would pop up on the radar screen. But the engine that drives the evolution of the virus is the propagation and replication of the virus, you know, across communities and across people. So like the more we let that go as we're rolling out the vaccine, the harder it's gonna be to control the virus through the vaccines, if that makes sense. So like, you know, even if the vaccines are being rolled out very efficiently, we need to keep all of the other uh, public health safeguards in place. And actually we need to kick them up a notch to make sure that the vaccines have a chance to, to really work and, outmatch the pace of the the evolution of the virus that's that's kind of where we're kicking at things kicking things up a notch might be tricky with a population that has already kind of had it yeah and feels that the end is in sight and 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 are prone to let their guard down I, and i'm so worried i'm so worried about that that like since people think that you know their vaccines have been invented that you know we can take our masks off and, and everything else and we are just not there right now like the um the one way to make sure that these vaccines will not be the panacea that they possibly could be is if people just start taking their masks off and start hanging out at bars and stuff. It's because um, basically we'll just end up with this really gnarly viral genetic soup, you know, where we have like a, a sea of different viral resistance mutants um, and it'll be very difficult to manage. So we really need to do both in tandem, like all of the, the basic crap, like washing the, the crap out of your hands. Uh, I, I don't think we can rely on 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 people to do that without some sort of government, uh, you know, um, intervention mandate. Mandate, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm in fan of a, a government mandate. I think we really need to have some very firm, you know, uh, federal guidelines that, that really and make that make sure that people do not congregate and everybody's masked and everybody's washing their hands all the time. Now, um, now, this this issue of a, of a, of the you know the continuous mutation of the virus. Obviously, yeah. this is a worldwide issue. What what the other yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, exactly. We're not going to be. I mean, we're just a blip on that. On that. I totally agree with you. And so, like, if there's you know a, a genetic variant that, uh, uh, for instance, has vaccine resistance somewhere across the globe, 
you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that it's going to wind up on our shores. I mean, it's like right. almost impossible to stop that. So it really, it, it's it's going to require a concerted global effort, um, you know, to to really make sure that the vaccines are being deployed as all these other public health safeguards are. So here's a question for you. Yeah. So I, I read somewhere that actually the the um, the drawing board, as it were, the the vaccine on paper was developed, uh, and the vaccine which we're actually using right away within weeks of the right. Yeah. It's a, if a if a variant were to pop up tomorrow, which this vaccine did not work on, yep. How quickly could we have a vaccine, and what are the chances that they yeah. would that they would speed up the approval process? Yeah. So I think, and so I, I'll be completely honest about this. Um, I don't like being wrong about stuff, but I have to admit I actually gambled against these mRNA vaccines. I thought, um, you know, since they didn't have any sort of track record and they were, you know, extremely novel. Um, I, I really didn't think they'd hit it out of the park with the first try, pretty much, and they sure did, which is awesome. Um, but one of the real mean? what does that mean? They hit it out of the park with the first. So, so, so the works. mRNA vaccine, right? This idea of just using um, it means it works, Perriam. Well, it means it works, but the actual this type of vaccine, right? This this type this construction of a vaccine, an mRNA based vaccine, is totally novel. So there are no other vaccinations that we have you know, that we've been using, uh, you know, like for polio or any, any other stuff that are based on this mRNA vaccine concept. It's, it's really a new vaccine concept. And so the fact that, um, you know, they could bring it to the table at this uh, point of extreme human desperation, and they just hit it out of the park right out of the gates, like it worked in the initial trials, right? And Which so is, what happens amazing. once you're vaccinated? Like you can, you're immediately like safe Periel, Periel, I don't expect you to be following the conversation, but he was about to answer the previous question, which was- I won't, I won't, I won't get, dist get distracted. Let me answer your question first, and then I'll go back to the other one. Um, and I'm also really hopped up on coffee, so I'm going really fast. But the um, one of the real awesome things about these mRNA vaccines is they're extremely simple, okay? So really what they are is just like a, a small stretch of nucleic acids inside like a little fat bubble. That's what they do. And they inject that into you, and it goes goes into cells, and then it- essentially uses your own cellular machinery to produce proteins that immunize you, right? But the real cool thing is since the vaccine is so simple, they can really just start printing essentially different versions of those nucleic acid strings to match the new genetic variants of the virus that show up, right? So that's really cool. And you touched on a really important point, which is that even if the, you know, the dorks in the lab can come up with new um, uh, stretches of mRNA that they can package in the, in the vaccines, really there needs to be changes in the regulatory oversight of the vaccine development so that um, rather than having to you know go through the whole hamster wheel every time they print out a new genetic variant um, of the vaccine it needs to be fast tracked because it's not really a new vaccine it's just sort of like you know vaccine 1.1 1.2 there's subtle subtle variations in the genetic sequence so um, I, I'm pretty optimistic I think there will be like uh, matching regulatory changes that will allow that to, to happen the other thing is that um, um, and, you know, this is something that's been explored a lot in the HIV vaccine design world. Um, in addition to just vac uh, vaccinating people against one, um, you know, genetic variant, like one at a time, there, there is a possibility that you could vaccinate people against a swarm, right? So that you could have multiple genetic variants that are represented in a single vaccine dose. So you're actually immunized against multiple circulating strains. Um, and as, as I'm guessing you already know, like uh, Moderna is already they have like a booster that they're already designing that's going to be um, yeah, focusing on one of the new genetic variants. So people that had the, the normal vaccine, you know, the, the first generation vaccine will be able to get a booster that's targeted towards like the UK variant. So what is your uh, estimation on when the comedy salad will be back up and running? Because Noam has no idea. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. And a lot of it is just there's so many uh, there's so much human behavior that has to be predicted um, uh, to, to make, to, to really figure that out. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know. Like when you say back up to normal, like where we can all kind of hang out, you know, in a cellar together with like no masks and I don't know. I think it's going to be 2022 probably. Ooh, I, 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 oh, don't say that. I, I really, I, I, I find it hard to believe that we'll be, that this calendar year we'll be able to just sort of all hang out indoors with, with no masks. Um, the way we were like, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. I, I I personally don't think so, but you know, I hope I'm wrong. We'll be back, Satish, I promise you. Yes. So, so, <laughs> sooner than you think. I, I, I'm a big, uh, I'm, I'm just like with the testing, actually, I'm, I'm yeah. quite optimistic that 
the logistics will ramp up very, very quickly. We're good at that yeah. in, in this country. And, and, it, it's, and, we, and we're also, we, we also have unreasonable expectations. We think that things hit the ground running. They don't. It takes a month, six weeks, whatever it is. And then, uh, um, then we do miraculous things, you know? So I, I think you're gonna see a, a real curve and I think that um, we're going to be all right. That's what I think. Yeah, I think we're going to be all right. I, I actually, I, I think we're not to go. Right. I just don't know the, no, the no, timeline. It's, it's the timeline that's in dispute. The timeline, the timeline, dispute. The time I, the time line, there's a lot of moving parts in that timeline and it's difficult to predict. But I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll go back to some type of normalcy that will be happy for all of us. I mean, at, at the same time, also, the, the treatments are getting much, much better. So <laughs> and that's also the fear of getting it is different. Yeah, the treatments and the other things, you know, there's subtle things, you know, just talking to my wife and other physicians, there's subtle things that they've been able to do, um, you know, in a clinical setting, even aside from any, you know, drugs to really improve outcomes for patients, like even little things like, you know, what they call proning, you know, like placing uh, yeah. individuals on their, you know, uh, on their tummies instead of their back. There's like little subtle things like that. They've already been able to take a good cut out of the mortality of the, the disease based on some very common sense, um, you know, uh, clinical changes that don't even involve the administration of drugs. I, I guess we got to wrap it up. Are they any closer to being able to make a better guess on an individual basis of whether someone is going to get a bad case or, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know that's something that, you know, my lab, we're, we're really interested in. So what, what you're talking about is essentially identifying clinical biomarkers that allow us to predict yes. whether somebody is likely to develop severe disease or not. As I was I'm toning sure down my language. But, but I said I was yeah, toning down word, my language. I like the word biomarker. Biomarker is one of my favorite <laughs> words. But um, whereas, but the um, as you already know, I'm sure like you know, there's some really great predictors already, just in terms of like age and comorbidities, like having diabetes, obesity, all of these other factors. Then there are other things. There are other components of the immune system, um, like something that my lab studies a lot is uh, something called interferon. Have you ever heard of interferon? Sure. So, you know, interferon is like a sort of a one size fits all chemical messenger that everybody's body produces um, that helps us fight a, a range of infections. And there's more and more data that suggests that there are deficiencies in that interferon network um, in individuals that can progress to severe disease. Um, and so the cool thing is, in addition to finding these predictors, we'll probably be able to develop a new generation of therapies that could correct some of these deficiencies that we find. Right? <laughs> Apropos of Larry King, if I could just uh, bring this up for a second. Now, he went into the hospital and, with COVID and he died, I guess, this week. Everything I've read, nothing said he died of COVID. Everything says he died after having been hospitalized for COVID. What gives? Seems obvious to me he died of COVID. And yet, every headline or every story I'm reading says Larry King died after being hospitalized with COVID. Nobody says he died of COVID. Explanation, if you have. I, I really don't know. I, I have no no idea. It's out, out of my daily way. I, I have mean, another question about the the, the uh, comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Is it if you have diabetes, you have a higher risk of dying, right? Yeah. But does that mean when you have diabetes, you have a higher risk of having a bad case of COVID, or is it just like mm. if you all have a, I you know because it seems like some people get this, old people too, people have risk, and they barely become symptomatic, or they have a light cold. Yeah. And then. So yeah, right. like, but, but like if, if my friend gets a really bad flu or an 80-year-old gets a really bad flu, yeah, the 80-year-old is going to die. But is that the reason they got a, war, a bad case of it? That's what I haven't been able to understand. That's a great question. So basically you're asking whether it's also correlated with having just symptomatic or aggressively symptomatic disease uh, aside from actually being on a ventilator or something. Yes. And to be honest, I don't know. All of the correlations I've seen have been with extreme outcomes. They've been with... Um, you know, either requirement for oxygen or um, a really winding up on a ventilator or like hospitalization times, those are the outcomes. But in terms of just sort of like more of a bread and butter nasty case where you can still stay at home, I haven't seen any data supporting that like those comor mor mor morbidities are associated with that as well. Yeah. An interesting question. That's what's weird to me is the way some people just get nothing and other people is the worst sickness they've had in their life. Some people like they stay sick for eight months. Some people lose their taste. I mean, I've never yeah. heard of a disease like this before. So, yeah, and, and, you know, just without going too deep into the weeds, I think one, one reason why there's such a crazy diversity of outcomes with this infection, aside, uh, you know, which is very different from like influenza, is like, you know, influenza is kind of a classical respiratory infection, right? It infects your lungs and it gums up your ability to breathe. But this virus is really pernicious. It can really, um, it can get into lots of different tissues and it can wreak havoc in lots of places besides your lungs. So it can, you know, it can screw up your toes, it can screw up your kidneys, 
It can enter your brain. It can enter cardiomyocytes and affect like your, you know, heart lining and heart function. So it's like this thing can just damage so many different types of tissues and cells that you have this massive spectrum of pathology that you don't see with like a normal respiratory infection, you know? How come, how come we've never come across a virus that helped, that made us better in some way? Like how come we have a virus that makes us better or stronger? Wait, 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 you're totally wrong about that. You're oh, okay, absolutely good. wrong about that. Go so ahead, there are, first of all, I'm sure there are tons of viruses that we haven't characterized that help us, but check this out. Look up, this is one of, one of the most beautiful cases of, of, uh, of virology and medicine I've seen, but look up phage therapy, okay? But so- How do you spell that? Uh, what's that again? What, what did you call it? Phage therapy, so uh, phage is spelled P-H-A-G-E, right? Okay. So um, bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we have commensal bacteria, right? So we have lots of bacteria in our guts that help us, you know, make a living and help us digest our food. Then there are also pathogenic bacteria that, you know, screw up our lives. Um, but there are viruses that make a living by destroying bacteria. And some of those viruses specifically attack and destroy the bacteria that are harmful to us. Um, and so there's a whole evolving field called phage therapy now where you can actually either design or use these bacteriophage viruses to um, infect and destroy pathogenic bacteria. And, and mm -hmm. just to give you one little snippet, which I love the story so much, there's a, a, a professor at UCSD named um, Dr. Stephanie Strathby. Um, and I don't remember all of the details, but her husband, um, had a debilitating bacterial infection and they couldn't find anything to treat it. And she had this like eureka idea, this was probably like four years ago or something, where she decided to start doing like uh, just experimental phage therapy. Um, and sure enough, there, were, there was nothing, there's nothing the doctors could give her husband to save him. Um, and just through like some iterative experimentation, she actually was able to administer a dose of a, a bacteriophage that uh, could destroy this bacteria that was plaguing her husband and she <laughs> cured him. Check out that, I mean, look, look it up. I, I, I'm probably, I'm giving you a very crude oversimplification of the story, but that's basically what happened, which is pretty damn cool. Um, so viruses can, you, can help. Awesome. Would you include that, um, if you have a link to that, along with the one you said you're gonna yeah. send us about the speech? Like to check that yeah, out. Yeah, so the Tony, there's a, the Dr. Tony Fauci uh, forum thing and then the, um, uh, and this uh, phage, phage therapy thing with Dr. Therapy, yeah. I'll definitely send you that. That's, that's one, one of the coolest cases in, in modern biomedicine, I think. Um, I gotta go. My, 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 house, my, my son can't find his iPads. Oh. <laughs> Wait, I have one super quick question. Dean, what, did, what were you in The Sopranos? Whoa. Oh, I, I think I was the only uh, black male ever on The Sopranos that didn't play a drug dealer or um, a gay dude. Um, <laughs> because because that's what we played on that. No, I was in, uh, the episode was titled, Where's Johnny? Remember when Uncle Junior started losing it and he went back to the old neighborhood and I think one of the old places he hung out um, turned into like a kid's rec center and I got to kick Junior out of there. What you doing here, fool? <laughs> awesome. Oh my God, that's you. I yeah, that's, I had less hair. You watch less that. Yeah, oh yeah. my God, amazing. <laughs> but you can catch They Ready season two premiering on February 2nd, everybody. Nice. Nice. Uh, by, by the way, okay, just so Perry, you know, why don't you plug your that your that other thing you do? Uh, we're, we're not we're not okay. Oh. You know, had in the New York Times. How, did you sell more tickets because of the Times? Um, I we we sold a nice amount of tickets. Thank you. That's very how many more would you say you sold because of the Times? Um, honestly, I don't. I don't know. I mean, not not as many as I would have thought. Like yeah, it's not like. Um, but that didn't really phase me as much because now I every time I talk about the show, I just say as seen in the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, your, your, um, your son found his iPad because he's calling my son. So oh, oh, <laughs> that's funny. Everything <laughs> is. <laughs> um, I host and produce a comedy show on Zoom every Sunday with um, Jessica Curson and Rachel Feinstein, mm -hmm. and it's um. It's just like totally fucking bananas. It's called We're Not Okay Comedy Show, and it's really fun. But um, yeah, 
I, I watched it one time. It was really good. Thank you. I take that as a big compliment coming from you. It and really then I was. have I have one final question because no one, <laughs> yeah. no one I had a big um, argument about this about so Satish I want to know what you have to think uh, what you think about um, Dr. Jill Biden wanting to be called doctor. Hell yeah, she should be called doctor. She's got yeah, a she, PhD. Why why should she, she be called that, doctor? Yeah. Well, we have that. Most people who are not medical doctor, well, no, why don't you say what you said? Well, just, just for the record, I thought that the guy who wrote the original column was was a very, uh, was, you know, version on disrespectful. In the way yeah, I read that column. Yeah, yeah no, I wasn't, I didn't like, I didn't like, I didn't like the tone of the column at all. However, from all the research I've done, um, major newspapers, the AP, whatever it is, that they don't and have never used um, doctor to describe anything but medical doctors. And it's weird when somebody um, har harps on a credential that they want mentioned about their name, especially when we all know, uh, it's, it's, a, 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 it's not even a full PhD she has, it's some other doctorate in education. I mean, this is not, it, it, it does not, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I have a JD, Juris Doctor. So I suppose I could ask to be, you know, have that one refer to me as, you know, Dr. Dr. Gnome. I mean, yeah, or Juris, as, as um, Esquire. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's just like, it's weird. It's not, it's not a real credential. A, 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 a advanced degree in education doesn't compare to a master's degree in virology. I mean, come on now. No, <laughs> well, I, 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 don't, I don't feel that way. Well, I I can, I'm telling way. you, I know from experience, I come from a family that had educators in the family, and I'm telling you that uh, this is gobbledygook. We, well, but anyway, in, in my high school, we had a, my English teacher in 12th grade was Dr. White. I assume yeah. she was not a medical doctor. We all called her Dr. White. Um, He's no one did to I don't, can I finish my teacher. sentence? You're right. Yes, Dan, go ahead. I apologize. I don't know if she, outside of the context of a, of our high school, was referred to as doctor, but it certainly, in a uh, academic context, one often will refer to somebody with a PhD as doctor. Right. Yeah, apparently, it's, you, you every Google it at home. Apparently, it's not a full. It's not. A, it's not a, uh, an act. It's a different kind of PhD. And if there have been editorials in major newspapers on this subject prior to Jill Biden, where they have said, you know, come out against the idea of you know this this ultra respect for the term. Doctor, it's not. There's many people that have said. What about Doctor? What about Doctor Martin Luther King Jr.? I mean, as I recall, yeah, that's a not, tough one. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Doctor King, I know. I never heard Doctor King say, "Check your blood." Well, I'm doing a bad impression. He wasn't a medical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would argue. And you gotta check your blood. Yes. I would argue with two things. I would argue two things with Doctor King. Number one, I don't believe he ever corrected people for not using doctor. Right. Number, number two, when a man is that um, important and, and that uh, admirable, the, the urge to want to pay him that respect is, is, is quite understandable. And I would not compare it to the urge to call Dr. Jill Biden doctor. I mean, you, you, we want to pay our respects to Dr. King or Martin Luther King any way we can. So we're happy to use that, I think. And I, I you know. But, but, but it does, wait, let, 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 it does let, demonstrate that we do use the term doctor in non-medical context. Yeah, we do. Of course we do. Go ahead, Dean. No, I was going to say, what about when Bugs Bunny says, what's up, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Mister? That was the same right. I mean, Bill right. Cos Bill Cosby used to like to be called Doctor, right? I mean, come on, right? I think it's said at the end of the show, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, come William on, H. come Cosby. on. Yeah. So I, I will say, I will say this: unless if we abolish the term Doctor for anything but medical doctors, one major problem is there is a real bias. So if you look, um, uh, uh, females are more likely to not be referred to as Doctor, even if they, you know, if you compare people that have mm -hmm. the same exact level of education and training and success, right? there's a bias where males will be called doctors more often than females. So I think that's like uh, pretty dangerous uh, ground. So unless if there's some universal decision that does not call anybody with a PhD a doctor, I think 
basically, if you got a PhD, you should be called doctor across the board. It's got to be one or the other. The I, one I, I, don't, I don't think that, so. The one example that Noam gave that, you know, sort of had me thinking that he had a good point was he said, you know, if you're on an airplane and you have a heart attack and so yeah. this is there a doctor <laughs> on the oh, I didn't give you that example. That was somebody, <laughs> somebody else said that. Dude, um, I, I, I've had this thought so many times, but I've been on multiple airplanes where, where you know, they'll be like, oh, we need a doctor right away. And like all the time I want to walk up there and be like, oh, no, I can't do anything, but I will, I will sequence his DNA. Like, I just, I just, just, just but, but I think in that context, just, just, people just, understand what's being, uh, what's being required. Just to be clear, because, and this is, mark this day on your calendar, because this was the day that doesn't happen often, that Peril didn't actually understand my point. I, I was, it was not that I object to anybody calling her doctor. I, I've never, that's never cared. What I, what, I, what I object to is the ultra concern, you shall address me at, and I say, no, you know, come on now. It, it, this is a, in my opinion, it's kind of an inferiority complex when somebody does that. And the fact that people were criticized for not calling her Dr. Biden when, there's, there's no rule that you have to refer to someone as a PhD as doctor. I, I, I could say I had Maya Angelou on my show. I could say I had Dr. Maya Angelou on my show. Nobody would say, how could you say Maya Angelou? You know, it's never, I've never, this has never been a thing before. And like I said, the AP, I believe it was the Washington Post, a few of the, the big shots have had a, a stylistic rule for years not to refer to doctor except for medical doctors. So there's a reason they do that. So, you know, this is just, but I, I don't have anything against Joe Biden and I don't, I don't care if somebody calls her doctor or want to be nice to her, whatever it is. I just, I'm just not that impressed with the credential, I'll tell you that. You know, I, I am quite impressed with medical doctors. Well, that depends. I mean, if they went to like the University of Granada Med School, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't like to see the word universidades on my doctor's <laughs> diploma. I mean, have you read from time to time, you, you, have, you have the ability to read like the dissertation of somebody with a, you can see them online of somebody, you know, who had, wrote a dissertation, you know, for a PhD, something in education or something like that. This is not, I, I mean, they're terrible. <laughs> New, York, New York City has done uh, tests of their own teachers with doctorates and they couldn't, they couldn't do basic grammar. I mean, come on now. This is, let's let's be honest. You know, I don't, I'm not saying anything about Dr. Jill Biden. She may be a genius for all I know, but the the credential does not make her a genius. And being a genius uh, is not more impressive because you have the credential. You know, it, it doesn't mean the credential itself is not very meaningful to me. As opposed to when you go through all the years of medical school and then you pass those exams, that means something. That is an accomplishment. I don't, that I do not think is equivalent to the accomplishment of getting a PhD in a social science. In my opinion, I could be wrong. Sorry, people at home. I don't mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, That's bad, sociologists. I don't mean it as bad as it sounds because, you know, I, I think there are brilliant people uh, in every walk of life, uh, in, including, you know, jobs you never- I think, I think there are brilliant people in every walk of life, but I think that I think that uh, physicists and mathematicians have to be at the top of the uh, to, of the list. I may be actually the opposite. I think I'm actually the opposite of an elitist in in that way, and it's coming out the wrong way. I actually have little regard for titles and experts and wh whatever it is. I don't find the average doctor that I meet to be more intelligent than the average guy, average waiter or waitress. Actually, you know, I just don't. Yeah. But I think when somebody puts their nose to the grindstone and does seven or eight years work or something and, and accomplishes and gets a credential and passes an exam, that has to be, that's, that's an accomplishment. You have to respect that, you know, whatever. Okay. Is that it? Can we go? Satish, Satish should come on like every couple months, you know. Well, he well, is hopefully we won't need him anymore because the pandemic will be over. I mean, we'll that's still right, have that's right. Jeez, okay, I'd hope he has more need beyond the pandemic. <laughs> That's his Jeez. main thing, but but uh, he is a musician as well. We could have him on to sing for us, I suppose. Oh, I'd love to do that sometime. Dean is a musician also. Nice. Yeah, Dean, I, I, what, what do you what do you play? I spit bars, son. Nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, but he's extremely musical because he can sing and he's he's very musical. No, thank um, you, no. You thank don't play you. any instrument. I, no. I played cornet for six. I played the trumpet for six years. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can tell you. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, Perriel. Trumpet as objectively difficult as piano and guitar, or are all instruments equally difficult to be at a virtuoso level? Well, it seems to be a trumpet, you blow into it, you play one note at a time. I mean, a guitar and a piano, there's a billion different notes and fingerings and... I, I, I didn't say it was uh, difficult. I don't no, know. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm oh. just it's a separate question. Because oh. I'm learning guitar right now on my own here in my apartment. It's probably a pandemic hobby. And I took trumpet in high school. I mean, I wasn't any good at that because I, I didn't practice. But I mean, this guitar, this shit is insane. Well, trumpet guitar, is not not an easy instrument, though. No. Is it? It wasn't just it wasn't just one note. The three keys you have multiple multiple notes. You just play um, three, just like hot cross buns all day long. That's right. all you do. <laughs> I, I, I think I think you correct me if I'm wrong about trumpet. And actually, this is there is a relationship. Well, some instruments harder than others. Is my there point. is a relationship between this and the uh, the I other conversation about the doctorate? I think that the trumpet um, depends to a certain extent on a certain natural physical ability in your embouchure to produce uh, the notes. The actual physical three fingers can't, cannot right. be, in my opinion, compared to two hands playing, you know, d d 10 right. notes at the same time in contrary motion on a piano, or even the, um, the, the individual uh, coordination you need of, of four limbs on the drums, you know, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. a, but um, having said that, uh, to play any instrument in a way that is brilliant, as it were, for lack of a better word, is equally hard on any instrument. And that, and that mm -hmm. is a matter of the human, soul and talent and in other words if if you're a brilliant artist if you have a brilliant musical soul you will express it on any instrument any right. instrument even right. even even rudimentarily on a piano yeah. you will make more music than a virtuoso who doesn't have doesn't have the soul for it so right. it's really weird to compare what's all, every instrument is it's very hard to make beautiful music on any instrument. Put it that I way. I kind of agree with that, that the virtuosity, like I don't think it's easier to really attain some level of virtuosity. I don't think it's easier on one instrument than another. I will say this, the learning curve is disproportionately ugly on different instruments. So I will say that yeah. my daughter, I hope my daughter doesn't hear, hear this, but like <laughs> the violin, like when you're, when you're starting out on the violin, it's like, it takes a long time before you can make uh, noises on that instrument that aren't like, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, right. um, whereas on the piano, yeah. I feel like you can attain some level of proficiency a lot quicker on a piano because it's laid out in front of you. And, right. and, and in general, if you compare fretless instruments to instruments with frets, right? Instruments that have discrete notes versus ones where you have to manage the pitch. You have to manage, you I, I feel like there's the kind of uh, a line in the sand between those classes of instruments. Dan, what do you think? I think all instruments are hard when you're blind. I don't know how those guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, 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 from time to time, you see the ratings, and classic, classical guitar is often rated as the most difficult instrument mm -hmm. um, for various reasons. But guitar and piano, I mean, the, the, for one obvious reason is that they have many notes to worry about it at simultaneously. Oh. <laughs> hey, there's a child <laughs> behind you. <laughs> He's looking for his <laughs> iPad again. Have you, are you looking for? No, I found it. You found it? Oh, you found it. Good, good. Okay. Okay. So, I wanted. I wanted to ask you something. Okay, but you know I'm doing a radio show. Yeah, but you know this is actually being broadcast on on Sirius Radio. You know, you really yeah, don't. Yeah, I know. You, okay, okay. So why don't you go stand and wait for me, and I'll call in a minute. Everyone, ask me really quick. Ask me really quick. Well, there's something here. So, and so I'm, not, I'm trying to figure out how to make my little Roblox thing. So I I look at a video all by myself. No help. So then. Okay, you can have. This is too long. You're it's not long. It's not long. <laughs> See again. Okay. So then the video has some I did not have. What's the question? And it will work backwards if it's worth it. I need to figure out how to get this thing. Ah, <laughs> I need to figure out how to get this thing. Okay, we're going we're gonna to have to take care of this later. Um, well, how long do you think? So? Well, uh, two minutes, two minutes. Go, go, go. <laughs> okay, Hi. so Dean, Poor kid, is ready? Yeah. Look, I was, I, I was going to do Donkey for him, but I didn't know if he, if he was familiar with Shrek or not. <laughs> no, it's too late. <laughs> he is. <laughs> where where can we see your special? Oh, on on Netflix. Premieres on Netflix. Um, it, it, we premiered uh, February second on Netflix. They ready season two. Amazing, Satish. Where can we find you? Wait, wait, I just want to ask Dean again. What's the name of this on Netflix? Oh, it's Tiffany Haddish presents They Ready season two. Oh, awesome! All right, I'm gonna check that out tonight. Um, 
cool. So for me, it doesn't I, premiere until next next Tuesday on the second, though. Okay. All right. But add it to your watch list. Oh heck yeah! Well, I definitely will. The um, and in, in terms of me, I'm just so bad with any sort of social media or anything. But what I do have, I have a website that's palilab.ucsf.edu. So palilab.ucsf.edu, um, right. and then I have a bunch of links there. The vaccines that um you can disseminate to um. <laughs> I got I got a, I got a room full over here, so you know just just stop by. It'll cost you. <laughs> Um, you can find us, where, where can everybody email us, you guys? Podcast at ComedyCellar.com. Podcast at ComedyCellar.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Live from the Table. And um, Chicago Manual of Style, by the way, says doctor is reserved for medical doctors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, let's get, the, let's get the partisan battle out of this. This is all predates, predates the issue. Okay. All right. Good night, right. everybody. Thank Good you. Good night, y'all. Y'all take care. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Good seeing you. Take care. Good seeing you guys. All right. Later. All right. Later, brother. Take care.